Hello, everybody, and welcome um, here to our community stream today with our very special guest, Anne-Marie Scott. And before we go and jump into talking using open source tools as key infrastructure, I just wanted to reassure you that Oh, it is not Sunday. You're not listening to DS106, but there's no promises whether there might be silliness happening here on the stream. Um, <laughs> so we're so thrilled that you're here. And if you're joining us in Discord for the live chat, then feel free to say hello. Anne Marie and I just have. So, yeah, welcome to you. And hello, Anne Marie. Hello, Marin. This feels awfully familiar. What did you say to me about two seconds ago before we went live? It's like DS106, but with pictures, with videos. <laughs> It's like That's television, right. Marin. It's not radio, it's television. <laughs> well, well, it's in my it should be radio. <laughs> Does Reclaim Hosting know what they're doing? They've let us on the telly. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> For me, it's Friday afternoon. Jim isn't working, so it's all fair game. <laughs> we'll, we'll do what we like then, yes. Yeah, Friday afternoon for me too, but we were also oh, just saying, no. like, Friday afternoon for me in body. Uh, I think my head is still somewhere in Western Canada. I, I've arrived back from three weeks in Vancouver. Sometime this week, I'm not entirely sure when it was. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, particularly on the back of long haul flights. And, you know, we're obviously keen to hear about all the things you're currently working on. And I know that there are some fantastic Canadian projects that you are involved in. So, yeah, really excited to hear about that. So what we're hoping to talk to you about today is like, you know, a bit of a mix between how did you get to where you are now? <laughs> and, you know, we only have 45 minutes for this whole thing. So we are <laughs> going to have to make some edits. A, a plane flight. We covered that two minutes ago. <laughs> and then also, um, I want to give a big shout out to Open Education Week, because that's happening um, next week for us now as we record this, I think. And um, we had Alan Lewin on one of these a couple of weeks ago, kind of giving a preview. And I know you are very involved in all things open. Um, and we'd love to hear a bit about, you know, some examples of projects or developments you're currently involved in, kind of thinking about the, you know, main topic for the session today. So yeah, should we start on with the with the kind of, you know, how did you get to where you are now? <laughs> oh my God, my edtech origin hero story was how you phrased it, I think, which is- That's it right, absolutely. It was interesting thinking about that. Um, because there's two bits to it. There's the open bit to it, and then there's the ed tech bit to it, and they're different. They're not the same thing. Um, so I will skip over. I worked in private industry for a while after I graduated. Didn't like that very much, ran away. Um, came back into the University of Edinburgh in, in 2002 um, to work on a student portal project, which was, it was a homegrown project. It was one of these collaborative um, you know, inter-institutional projects that when we used to do that sort of thing, when the sector gave money to universities to develop systems that they shared between them, crazy stuff. Um, and then we, so we did that and then we built a thing and we launched it and it was a student portal. Um, and then we wanted to do an enterprise portal. We wanted to do one for, mm -hmm. for staff and alumni and visitors and, and one big thing. Um, and then we thought, well, should we build that? Uh, building that first one was quite hard, by the way. So do we want to build that? Or should we look for a solution maybe that already exists? Mm -hmm. And so we had a look around. And um, I remember coming down to a choice between two things. <laughs> Oracle Portal, excuse me while a little bit of sick comes into my mouth, and uPortal, which was an open source tool um, mm -hmm. developed in the US, but again came out of the university space. Um, and we went with uPortal. We went with the open source one. And I spent a number of years then building out um, Edinburgh's enterprise portal um, offering across alumni and staff and students mm -hmm. and a whole range of things. And there's like a whole other story of my life in that space. Um, and then I, for a number of years while I was at Edinburgh, I inherited teams and systems that needed a bit of love. And mm -hmm sort of um, loved them and fixed them up and, and moved on from them. And so the next thing, big thing, there were lots of bits and pieces around this, but the next big thing that came my way was identity management. Oh, and again, I inherited yeah. a team and uh, a platform, um, both of which needed a little bit of love. Um, the platform 
uh, scared me a lot. Um, I used to get regular reports saying, it, you know, running 100% CPU for like nine hours a night and might crash and burn. And it was how everybody in the university got their accounts for all the major systems. <laughs> I feel quite unwell about that. So again, we, we redeveloped it. We built an enterprise identity management system. And again, we had a look at what was out there, what, what solutions already existed. Came very close to using Sun Microsystems solution, which had just been open sourced at that point in time. Um, and then uh, Oracle, a little bit of sick, came up into my mouth again, uh, turned up again <laughs> and bought some and messed all of that up. Um, and we ended up building our own, but using some substantial pieces of open source middleware, including a tool called Group. Um, and I learned a lot in those two projects about big enterprise systems and about using open source as key infrastructure. There were other bits in that big identity and access management architecture that already existed, things like Open LDAP and an open source single sign on solution. Um, and I got involved in various communities behind you know, related to these projects, including one called Java Architecture Special Interest Group, snappy title. Um, <laughs> Did that have a fun acronym? <laughs> yeah, they started in 1999. I got involved with them in about 2003 um, mm -hmm. and stayed involved with them until um, around 2009, 2010. Um, when I stepped back fully from a lot of the enterprise portal stuff, I was sort of heavily in, I was coming to the end of the identity management stuff as well. Um, and and then yeah, at Edinburgh, another another team, an area that needed a little bit of love was the EdTech team. And I um in two two thousand and six, I'd started to do Edinburgh's MSc in e learning. Now the MSc in digital education. I was on the very first cohort of that. I'd started to do that program, and so when the e learning EdTech thing came up, I thought, ooh yeah, thank you very much. I fancy that. I've been reading about that. That's very interesting. And I'd had lots of interaction because you know enterprise portals link to all of these things. Identity management is how all the accounts and all of these tools get put together. I'd also worked on a few open source um, ed tech solutions with Jen Ross. People may know who was Dr. Jen Ross from, from Edinburgh when we were young and fresh faced and innocent. Um, we worked on an open source portfolio tool together, for example. So I've been swirling around this area, um, very interested in it, doing a lot of the stuff that made it accessible to the institution and made it work at scale. Um, doing a lot of stuff in open and then, yeah, moved into that um, ed tech space around sort of 2010. Um, and stayed there until I left to go to Alberta in 2020. <laughs> um, yeah, but the JSIG thing in um, in the early, I'm trying to think of my dates now and not fluff them up, in the early 2010s, JSIG merged with the Sakai Foundation and became Aperio, the Aperio Foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I stepped back in <laughs> nearly six years ago now, and I've been board chair since 2018. Um, so I'm coming to the end of my second term on the board there, and I'll be stepping down sometime this summer. So that's a very long winded way of saying I've got an ed tech background and I've got an open background, an open source software background, particularly that predates my time in ed tech. And so <laughs> But it gave me that overarching um, kind of enterprise view of how open can fit into an enterprise and how you can use open at scale, as well as in maybe some of the small uh, small areas that, like the open source portfolio thing that I did with Jen. Um, so I did things like the the blogging platform at Edinburgh, which wasn't just a learning technology blog, it was WordPress. It wasn't just deployed as a, a learning technology tool. It was there for public engagement research. So it's an enterprise tool. It was part of the institutions. It is an enterprise tool. It's part of the institution's web publishing strategy as much as it's part of its teaching and learning strategy, part of its research outreach strategy. Um, so I got this kind of big picture thinking from that stuff but also that that knowledge that you can use open tools as big infrastructure um mm. anyway 
that's that's a rambly long story. <laughs> ah, I love that. I really love that. And um, we were we were talking recently within our team at Reclaim around you know how people find their way into open education, into ed tech. And, and where that overlaps. And um, in this month, later this month, we actually, we're gonna have a dedicated kind of session all about sort of ed tech origin stories. And I think it's definitely, um, you know, it's so interesting to me to think about how we bring all these different interests that we have in life into that space, you know, because there's so many different nuances between, you know, sort of the legal, political, there's the climate aspect, you know, there's social justice piece, there's lots of creativity involved. So I think lots of people who are kind of in the current generation of kind of open ed, ed tech kind of people, you know, have come from different backgrounds. You know, very few of us have started in ed tech outright and then stayed there for the, you know, we've kind of built the degrees and the pathways for professionalization for people, you know, who are now starting to enter the, the profession. Yeah. Now, I think I think the variety of origin stories is, is really interesting. And of course, we don't stay the same either. So although mm. I I mean, I have a literature background and I know you don't have a technical background either. Many no. of us feel, um, have a humanities background, surprising number of us have a humanities background and not a, not a sciences or social sciences background. Um, but I, though I came to it through a technology route, I've never been a hands-on programmer. I've always been a mm -hmm. kind of systems thinker, coordinator, doer of things. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, after I left Edinburgh, I moved to Athabasca University in Canada, which is an open university. So mm -hmm. that, you know, open gets bigger again in my head at that point. And that's where a lot of the pieces around equity and access really become quite you know that that's the focus then technology mm -hmm. is how you do it is one of the tools in which you do it but an open university and and when i say an open university i mean an open admissions policy so anybody can come and study at undergraduate level um mm -hmm. you know it really changes your thinking and i wanted that mm -hmm. change, you know from mm -hmm. Edinburgh, a very traditional research university highly competitive um maybe i mean it's a large university so it's got diversity in that sense but in terms of the broad sweep of people who come through its doors i mean open universities mm. it's a people. different yeah they're, they're different they're very very different and in a really exciting and creative and interesting kind of a way and mm. i will probably touch on some of that <laughs> yeah some of that. oh absolutely and I think that open piece you know and, and as you say things don't stay the same and we always have to you know there are always new communities to reach out to and and new people with whom to win that argument about open and I think that's one of the things I've been really enjoying you know working with the team here at Reclaim is to kind of learn more about the capacity building and the kind of you know the skills and the knowledge that people need to use technology, you know, yes, you know, ultimately you do need the infrastructure, you need the, you need the service, you need the hosting, but you do need all the other stuff on top of that as well. And you need to have, you know, staff who learn about all the, the possibilities in order to then make some choices, you know, with their learning technologists, with their academics. But talking about an open piece, so we did say next week is Open Education Week. And, you know, it's so it's a big, exciting, like I'm looking forward to, I think I'm joining at least one of the sessions that Alan Noreen is organizing um, for OE Global. And I'm really excited about that conversation. But I've been kind of thinking about, you know, what do I think are like the big issues right now that I'm focused on and that I'm interested in when it comes to open. And I guess I wonder what your sort of, you know, like you have lots of different projects going on you have a wide portfolio really but if you do. had to pick you know well you do I know and you know it's a it's a global picture for you and in your open aperio foundation chair role you have an even bigger view but if you had to pick sort of one or two issues that are currently you know on the forefront of your mind when it comes to openness in education what what are those kind of topics um well, so it, I think it's fair to say, or it's important to say, I haven't 
been in a university setting full time since March last year. So that has changed. And I've been working part time for some universities as a consultant. Um, but I've spent quite a bit of my time working um, with Perio. And I'm also on the board of the Open Source Initiative now as well. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know who OSI are, they are the global stewards of the open source definition. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's 25 years old now. And they one of the main things they do is scrutinize and approve licenses mm -hmm. for open source software. So the mm -hmm. MIT license, GNU, various others, and they give them the stamp of approval. They compare them against that open source definition and and um, and say yes, this adheres to or no, this does not. Um, so yeah. I've been doing quite a quite a lot of work with them. So my focus when I'm thinking about education is is a bit different now. So um, you know I don't have a project in an institution that we've been working yeah. on towards. towards um, the week of chair in, in Open Education Week. Um, but I've really been thinking a lot about, through that work with Aperio and OSI, I've been spending a lot of time in the broader open source community. And what I'm really seeing is a fundamental disconnect. So I'm going to, I went to a big open source conference in Raleigh called All Things Open. It's the one of the biggest that happens in, in the US in the open source mm -hmm. scene, open source development scene. It's about 4,000 people. And I walk in and I get my Google lanyard and I go walk around the, it's not really a vendor hall, but it's mm -hmm. sort of is, um, but I walk around it and there's Microsoft and there's Salesforce and there's AWS and like every big tech company is there. And I'm there with some colleagues, one of whom has just been to Educause a couple of weeks before. And he walked around the Shark Tank at Educause and all of those same companies were there. <laughs> yep. So so we go to something like Educause. I, I didn't this year, but, you know, collectively, mm -hmm. we go to something like Educause and there is no conversation about open source. Mm -hmm. None at all. <laughs> and then we go to All Things Open and all the same companies are there. And I'm looking at open source program offices in big Silicon Valley companies mm -hmm. that are run by people who are kind of fundamental and foundational in open sources history people who started apache and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and i'm i struggle with that cognitive dissonance that, that there is an enormous vibrant open source development world out there and now that we're hitting into regulation of open source software we we have to do software bill of materials to understand what's in a, stof, a software stack so we're starting to get information about how much open source is used to build commercial software between mm -hmm. 70 and 90 percent of commercial software is built on open source yeah i go into universities and i talk in universities and and it's like tumbleweed um, mm -hmm. it's, there's such a disconnect there um, that there's all this innovation happening in in one space, all built on open source, all enabled by open source. The European Union has has costed up some of the economic benefit of open source yeah. and in billions of euros. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're not in our education system. Where, by the way, we're supposedly training computer scientists who are going to go and work in these fields as well. So, I really struggled with that that disconnect mm -hmm. in this last year and really felt it I knew it was there but I've really felt it sharply this week I think I posted something on Mastodon at one point saying I'm just a girl standing in front of a 4,000 person open source software conference begging higher education to believe it's a thing. <laughs> oh I I hear you I really hear you and I I it is you know, in lots of different ways, I think that sort of disconnect plays out all the time, you know, even with quite small scale projects within a university, let alone when you talk about, you know, enterprise systems. And um, it is, it continues to be kind of perceived, I think, as somewhat of a niche, you know, like a nice to have, like, you know, yeah. if you have a surplus of money and time, yeah. then it's okay to play with open things, but somehow, you know, higher education or education as a whole doesn't seem to get that, you know, they're missing out on where to get more time and money from, um, you know, which would be through the open source um, tools and resources and infrastructure. So yeah, it, it doesn't, um, 
there always seems to be so much more scope for advocacy, you know, no matter how many reports we write about textbook savings. And, you know, as you say, like that EU study about open source um, savings as well. It's just incredible. Well, and, and that's that that study actually wasn't about savings. That was about what open source generates economic okay. Because mm -hmm. it's because by having a vibrant open source ecosystem, you can build on it, you can reuse it. So mm. it doesn't just save you money, it allows you to innovate faster and it generates, mm. it's got economic productivity. And the reason I bang on about this, if I you know put my put my education hat back on again, is mm -hmm. there are things that digital can do to enable access to education, to do really creative and interesting things for people who can't physically come to campuses. For, you know, I think about, again, open universities, they're, they're largely online because they're serving a really varied population, many of whom um, can't physically come to a campus because they have caring responsibilities. Mm -hmm. A disability or money mm. is tight or there's a whole range of reasons in there and they work mm. as well as study <laughs> there's um and digital's a real enabler and mm. and when when deployed thoughtfully and sensitively is a real mm. enabler well, you know pandemic aside um and so you know Companies who make a profit in this space, and I've no problem with you know people making a profit in this space. We claim we're a commercial company, not not anti-commercial, um, but they go where there's a market, mm -hmm. and some of the things we want to do that are important to do for quality education don't make money. They probably mm -hmm. never make money they're a bit niche mm -hmm. but they're game changers for some of the students who who can work with them um and so i i really think this kind of strong bias towards procured vendor driven low risk to the institution offshore all your outsource all your mm -hmm. life all your risk right. to somebody else yeah. we, we miss something about access and inclusion and learner mm -hmm. agency in there and that's the space that open open plays in the open education plays in but the open source can enable mm -hmm. um, so i really i really worry about you know the kind of homogenization and dumbing down of digital yeah. education if we don't allow open into that space <laughs> we don't own it ourselves We're i know yeah owning the and and this is an anglophone problem to be clear what you mentioned the kind of broad sweep that i get to see through through the work i do with these foundations this isn't what it looks like in parts of europe if you speak no. another language and you have the privilege of working with other communities this isn't what it looks like in other countries it doesn't have to be this way mm. the other ways of doing this yeah I hear you. I really do. <laughs> ah, and I, I think though that, you know, that capacity piece, like building that capacity and continuously, you know, supporting staff, you know, in experimenting, you know, in failing, like, you know, again, in, in, in a commercial context, it's completely a given that if you experiment with new technology, you know, a certain percentage of it will always go wrong. And in education, it's as if like nothing can ever go wrong. And you're like, well, you're never going to innovate at scale if your expectation is that every single project you do will always be successful at everything for everyone. That's not how the game is played. Um, and I, I, you know, and the staff development piece and the expertise piece is so strong, you know, and that's why I really admire the work um, like some of my colleagues like Taylor and Amanda do, you know, to try and draw out some case studies of saying, look, this is how this institution did this step by step using exactly these tools and they are free to use and you can use them too. And here is how, you know, because that piece that is always important, isn't it? That sort of capacity building piece, you know, that is, I think that's the magic dust for me. So I want to talk about one of my favorite ever things I get to do 
also for no money. I seem to all my favorite things don't pay anything. To like pay for the fun things I do. And I mean, I'm guessing a number of people listening to this either on Discord or who might watch it later are going to have heard of the, the open ETC, the open ed tech collaborative co-op, depends on what day of the week. We're yeah, we're big fans of the open we're, ETC. We're not strictly a co-op, um, but we try to operate along co-op principles. Um based in Canada um, for uh, it's a set of shared platforms for the whole of the British Columbian post-secondary system um, and uh, we take a lot of uh, inspiration from the work that Reclaim and, and others do um, but we we were writing a report over the last year um, I'll try to find a link to it and put it in Discord because it's, mm -hmm. it's a great read and it's got some lovely chicken illustrations. Um, but we were writing a report up because we've had a number of years of funding from BC Campus to, to mm -hmm. run this project now. Um, and we're really trying to tease out the benefits and the impact. So, yes, it's a shared set of platforms, primarily WordPress and Matter. Most other things have come and gone. And I think that's also part of that capacity building. We played with some things. Did they have utility or not? The sector had a chance to play with them some were worth keeping some were not but that's all good learning and everybody mm -hmm. got that but the core platforms that have persisted are matter most in wordpress mm -hmm. but what we do on wordpress is not just provide free wordpress hosting to to lots of institutions in the province um we provide the ability to create and share templates so uh -huh. if somebody develops a really cool site um mm -hmm. maybe something that <laughs> their students are going to use those students can clone it and use it and, and distribute it but anybody else on the platform can as well mm -hmm. and if somebody creates something really cool we can also help genericize it and create a generic template um so mm -hmm. there's one there for example for mapping projects that now okay. somebody else can take and run a student uh, collaborative mapping project with it's got a whole bunch of tools baked into mm -hmm. it so that point you made about the community building and the learning and we would not just got a platform that allows people to share best practices in running wordpress um mm -hmm. chris admins chat away in the background we've got a platform that allows learning designs to be encoded in templates and to be mm -hmm. shared with the whole sector Mm -hmm, so there's mm -hmm. layers of sharing and capacity building. There's technical capacity building. There's through the institutional reps that we have who do the kind of you know middle layer of proxying between institutions and, and us as a leadership team. And then that, that templating piece and that sharing of learning design across and learning designs and learning patterns across a whole sector. Um, it's phenomenally enabling and, and a huge piece of capacity building. Mm -hmm. um, and it costs, I mean, depending on, how, our grants have been $25,000 a year Canadian, and we struggle to spend them. In mm -hmm, terms of mm -hmm. hosting costs, it's 5000 or less. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, and th th it's problematic because it's obviously too small to fund properly because nobody knows how to fund small, cheap, and incredibly impactful. <laughs> 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 oh, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> And, and, you know, that is, I think, another piece of the puzzle, which is the kind of, you know, I think the open, like, the attractiveness of openness, I think, has, has these challenges where it is often nearly too cheap to be seen as competitive and robust and serious, you know, because you're like, well, I could just be doing this for 5,000 a year. Well, like the commercial vendor from platform X will come along and say, well, it'll cost 53,000 a year, which seems much like, you know, that doesn't seem to be a possibility that you could do it for 10% of the cost. But yeah. there's also, I think some universities, and I think in my experience, UK universities have this in spades. There is a kind of syndrome of it's not here. It can't possibly be suitable, good enough, or you know, hitting the sweet spot for my specific students, because my students are completely unique with very unique challenges that no one else in the world can have a template for. And, and while I empathize with that view, it is a challenge when you want to try and scale up, you know, things like that. Yet right now, all of those universities are being serviced by a very small, tight number of very generic tools. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there are three big LMS vendors who've got the market mm -hmm. fixed up 
Um, there are there's probably two video two and a half video streaming lecture recording platforms. I mean, it's it's not a diverse marketplace, <laughs> so we're all different and special, but somehow we all manage to use the same um, fairly generic and relatively interchangeable set of tools. <laughs> well, I had a low point this week in my use of video conferencing platforms in that I met a new AI, AI obviously, a super powerful um, coaching tool that gave me prompts as I was doing housekeeping announcements, which drove me around the bend. So yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to go into that because we'll still be here. Well, let, let's talk about AI just for two seconds because oh, I just yeah, want to okay. get a very quick plug for... As long as you speak for about AI rather yeah, than... Yeah, no, I mean, there will be no AIs <laughs> talking. No, so one of the other pieces of work that I've been in, involved in, in in the last year mm -hmm. um, is through the OSI and the work that the OSI yeah. is doing on trying to come up with an equivalent definition to the open source software definition for open okay. source AI. Okay. Um, because, yeah. and, and we're being funded to do this by a number of big industry players in recognition mm -hmm. of our stewardship of, of the open source definition um, mm -hmm. and that we are a knowledgeable and neutral organization who can do this because there's obviously vested interests in what that definition um comes out like and strong opinions and that's yeah. all fine you know people need to make money we want uh, I just talked about the benefit of open source is has been its enormous economic productivity um we want ai to the ai space to offer a lot of the same benefits um but it needs we think that same fundamental definition of what an open source AI is, or, or what is, yeah, what is the definition of open source AI that then various legal documents can be defined against. And yeah. can say, yes, this is, or no, this is not, um, yeah. based on a set of characteristics. And that has been, again, just a fascinating set of discussions. Um, mm -hmm. There's been some in, there was some internal drafting. We released the first public uh, version last year, All Things mm -hmm. Open, had a big mm -hmm. launch for it. And every month now, there is a new draft up on the OSI website. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but around it, a whole bunch of discussions. We did a call for um, proposals for a webinar series as well. And the recordings of all of them are there just so many creative thinkers in the in the software world in the ip world in the, the you know the legal world um mm -hmm. all in, in the ethics space um we've been talking we are involved with organizations like the, organizations like the digital public goods alliance um who are a un affiliated organization looking at technology as a digital public good and obviously open fits in that space just beautifully um it's it's been it's been a fascinating set of conversations i've learned a huge amount and i've had a lot of exposure mm. to incredibly smart people um and being part of discussions with people far far smarter than me um but it again i think it's kind of fundamental to what we want in education which i think mm -hmm. is some of the ability to own our own education system to build some of the things that we think are um important to have that, that commercial companies are never going to build for us or mm. i might have a vested interest in in building something that's actually quite inappropriate for for us um but we need that open source ecosystem ecosystem to be mm. able to do that and we also want there's lots of research happens in this space we want to be able to release it and share it openly and build upon it um not yeah. just for tech but you know for for bigger purposes than that there's a whole enabling open science agenda in here so again not I'm, like I'm doing it with that, I do it with that education purpose. That's why I care. I care about public education. I care about public education is now very digital. So I care about mm -hmm. the things that public education uses as digital as a form of digital public good. So I think they should be. Um, and and I also don't think you know if open education is about agency fundamentally, then you you. Know, and and it's digital then you need digital agency <laughs> so this is some mm. like that so i want to 
work because I think it's important. And again, I think you know education institutions should be engaged with it and aware of it. Ha, agency is a really key word here. And I can see like um, a few comments coming through on Discord, people whom what you're saying is really resonating with. Um, we are coming towards the end of time. So I want to give you a chance to give a shout out to any projects or project that you are currently involved in that we haven't had time to mention yet. Anything <laughs> else that's going on um, yeah. that you'd like to um, still give a, give a shout out to or, or talk a little bit about? Yeah. Oh, well, there's a couple. Of, there's a couple of things. Um, one is a yeah, shameless. Plug. One's a shameless plug. So I'll say that to the end. But um, shameless uh, plugs are super welcome. <laughs> Tell us the um, the OSI stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The other the other project that we're kicking off at the moment, and I want to give a heartfelt thanks to to Reclaim and Jim for giving us a, a domain name and some free hosting. I haven't set the WordPress site up yet. Um, is uh, an Aperio project called. Um, we're going to produce a kind of state of open source in higher education community report. Um, and there's a number of different areas of research that we're going to engage with to just try and map out some of the landscape of open source use in higher education um, and also kind of attitudes and understanding uh, amongst various leaders in higher education mm -hmm. towards open source. In many other places in open source you'll see the state of open source in kind of reports but they're very broad they're very big they're either country or or technology yeah. um, and we want to do that higher education slice because that's what our foundation is very very uh, focused on um because we know that 70 to 90 percent of what you are buying is built on open source so when you say you don't use open source you don't know what you've bought <laughs> <laughs> and you don't know how fundamental open source is to keeping the thing mm -hmm. you bought running by the way you might want to think about your own supply chain there um so i think that that is going to i really hope that's going to be uh, a talking point that it's going to dispel some myths and it's going to change the conversation a little bit but it's a, it's an enormous piece of work as well and we're we're in the process of setting setting the project up setting up the project structure we've got a whole bunch of co-authors um who've agreed to assist us with it we have a whole framework and a methodology for the research we want to do i'm slightly scared by how much there is to do um and we want to if we can get some first cut of some of the work out by Educause at the, towards the end of the year. Um, wow, so it, sounds it, very exciting. <laughs> I think, I mean, it, it is. And what we're also hoping is we'll, we'll, we'll work out what slice we can actually do because it's impossible to do this globally. Yeah. Um, so what we also hope we'll do is create a kind of methodology that other people could replicate in their own area yeah. as well if they wanted to, you know, to look at what it looks like in their jurisdiction. So mm -hmm. um, so that's the not shameless plug. And then the shameless plug is <laughs> <laughs> at OER24 in core. Oh, cool. Which, I, I don't know, was there something on Reclaim TV recently about that? I wouldn't know. <laughs> no, absolutely. We are on the road was, to OER for like well, a month I mean, and been shouting about nobody's it. Heard, nobody's heard of this one before. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about <laughs> I'm going to talk about open source program offices because I haven't talked about open source enough in the last what, 45 minutes or however long it's been. Um, again, oh, some guy called Martin Weller wrote this book called 25 Years <laughs> in EdTech. And in the introduction to it, he talked about how education forgets its history. Um, we, we, you know, we go around in these loops again. We forget our own history, and 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 history repeats itself. We keep making the same mistakes. Um, and one of the things that I'm seeing cropping up, particularly in the US, are open source program offices. And the story mm -hmm. is that these were uh, some smart person thought them up in industry. Um, as a way of creating a strategic management office for open source, because 70 to 90 percent of what you're building is relying upon it. So you probably want mm -hmm, to manage that mm -hmm. strategically. Um, so it's about, you know, how you contribute back, licensing. Uh, that, they're often there to support that. They're there as internal advocates in, the co in companies. Um, they're also often there um, to um, to bridge the, the gap between a company and a community. Um, that mm -hmm. whose product they're relying on ultimately yeah. as well as contributing to. And it looks different in different places. There's no one size fits all in this. Um, but we're told the story that this is a, an industry thing that we are going to 
uh, that is now being adopted into uh, education. Sloan are funding quite a lot of them uh, with a real focus on open science and open research, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least of open research, uh, including software artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful, lovely, no problem with any of that. Um, where did open source come from again? What industry? Wait, well, industry, what organization? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was MIT, was it? I think that's a university. <laughs> and I, I think, do you remember OSS Watch that was based mm -hmm. in, um, at the Oxford? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I mentioned JSEG earlier. That started in, in 1999. Mm -hmm. That was around the time that the first one of these OSPOs, I think Sun Microsystems may have had some, one of the very first. Um, often people benchmark Googles in 20, 2004 but there were some in the late 90s as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, this isn't new. I can yeah. point to various organisations, consortiums, uh, foundations like Aperio, organisations like OSS Watch, 10 years of just funding to provide a strategic open source management capability for the sector in the UK. Um, yeah. This isn't new. This, no. this, and it didn't, this isn't coming from industry into education. Open source came out of, of academia, mm -hmm. um, it came out of, of the universities. And it's kind of, you know, being as much as I want it back, <laughs> I don't want to be sold it back. <laughs> no, I don't want that narrative. I want us to understand our history and to own our history mm -hmm. and to see this as a continuation of that history rather than yet another way in which universities should adopt industry best practices because we're you know some kind of laggards that need disrupting or something so anyway I'm going to rant about that for 15 minutes that we are talking about. oh I love it and and what a fantastic you know preview and if you're listening to this um prior to oer24 don't miss Anne marie in in cork and um i'm so looking forward to seeing you there as i say some of my um my colleagues at reclaim and myself will be there as well also got our um 15 minutes of fame coming up we're going to talk about open ed tech and, and community building in order to create more capacity so I think it'll be a, a, a wonderful program. I'm really looking forward to the, the conference. And yeah, a um one Martin Weller will be there as well. So um really really books in tow. <laughs> I heard a story about him that his mother once made a pair of trousers for the king. <laughs> And so we go back to, to our origins on DS106. So uh, if you haven't had enough um, of Anne-Marie and me chatting, um, do find us next time we're on the radio. But um, for today, Anne-Marie, I'm going to wrap us up soon. So um, thank you so much for, for sharing all your expertise and excitement about OER24 with us. It's been fabulous to have us um, have you join us for the stream. Any final words? Well, just thank you for letting me say the words open source software so many times. <laughs> the defining feature of my year of self-employment slash unemployment has been the freedom to do the things that really interest me and the freedom to speak mm -hmm. openly about them. Because in senior roles in institutions, I've always felt like I've had to Oh, well, you work for an institution, right? So you there is a framework in which you're working yeah. within and, and there are policies and processes that you're working within. And um, yeah, um, and it's been lovely to just be able to talk freely about some of the things that I think are really important in, in the public mm. education system. Um, I'm going to give one final plug, actually, and I'm sure they will be plugging it hard over the uh, over Open Education Week. And that's the HE for Good book that um, Catherine Cronin and Laura Chernovitz uh, co-edited. Uh, they may or may not be keynote speakers at OER24. Um, and, um, and that book is open, uh, openly licensed as well. You can find it. It's published by Open Book Publishers. The reason I highlight it is if you haven't been bored to tears already by me talking <laughs> and open source procurement and European Union reports then I've got a standout chapter in that book with Brenna Clark Gray talking about procurement because we like all the hot and interesting topics <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I love it. Well, if you haven't downloaded the book yet, more. <laughs> niche, that niche chapter will definitely topic. sell it. <laughs> niche ed tech topics for sure. <laughs> oh. anyway. Well, thanks again for coming on. Um, it's been fabulous. And thank you to everybody who's been on the chat. I can see a few comments are flurrying around in Discord. So we'll have a look at these now. And Anne-Marie, thank you so much for joining us. And see you at OER24. And you yeah, to everybody you. else, have a good rest of your Friday. Thanks so thank much for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching and listening.